Okay, all right, so we are gonna go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to the winter virtual tasting for the Rocklands Farm Winery Cellar Club. Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, whether you're in the DC area or perhaps on the other side of the country, I know we have uh, a handful of members in California and other states. So we are happy to have you join us um, on this virtual call here at 7 p.m. Eastern on the East Coast. My name's Sean, I'm one of the co-founders here at Rocklands Farm Winery since we started in 2010. And I'm also the guy that sends you all the emails if you're in the wine club. So sorry in advance for that if it's too much. Um, but I manage the wine club here and, and do a few other things along with product development, working closely with Michael in that regard and with our front of the house operations that are largely spearheaded by Steph and Sarah, who you, you will meet here in a second. Um, and overall, we are a small business with about eight full-time staff and then um, quite a few part-time staff. If you ever come out on the weekends to the Rocklands Farm Tasting Room, most of our tasting room associates and operations staff who you will meet do work other jobs during the week and then they, um, they join us on the weekends at Rocklands when it's uh, particularly needed. So as you may have already gleaned with us at Rocklands, we are big on fun and education. We want this next hour to feel as personal as a virtual tasting can be through engagement with Michael in particular, who we'll introduce here in a second. To that end, if you do have a question, feel free to include it in the chat box at any time, and we'll do our best to answer all questions as they come in. We'll also be setting aside a bit of time at the end for any outstanding Q&A. So um, if, if your question didn't get answered or you feel, feel like it didn't, doesn't really apply to maybe the wine at hand, feel free to hold that for the end and we will have a little time here at the end of the hour. Um, there's no bad questions and our hope is that you're able to take away a bit of joy and knowledge after this hour is over. Um, we will feel very accomplished if that holds true. And while we would much prefer to see you in person and enjoy community in that way, um, there are certain advantages to conducting a tasting and a meeting in this format, maybe of which you've already learned if you do this on a daily basis for your job. Um, in particular, the ability to see many faces at one time between club members and our staff. So to that end, before we dive into the tasting, hopefully you already have some wines open, which would be great, um, with Michael. We do have several of our full-time staff here on the call, some of which you may have met or, and some you may have not, especially folks that aren't usually at Rocklands um, on the weekends or working in the front of the house type roles. So I wanna take a few minutes for our staff to introduce themselves and their role at Rocklands and then we will jump into the virtual tasting. So we're gonna start with Chris on our controller and business manager. Chris, take it away. Thanks, John. Hi, yeah, I'm Chris. Um, I've been at Rocklands for seven seasons, going on eight. Um, uh, as Sean mentioned, I'm the business manager here at the farm. I actually, um, I originally came on as the business manager and um, also had a dual role when we had a vegetable um, CSA and was the, one of the vegetable growers and um, CSA managers at the time. Um, yeah, my background and before I was at Rocklands, I was, I was really involved in a couple different farms all around the U.S. Um, focusing on sustainable and organic agriculture. Um, you might see my wife. I have my wife and seven-month-old. Um, you may hear them in the background, maybe crying. He's trying to get put to sleep right now. Um, but yeah, I'm just really excited to be here. Uh, like Sean mentioned, I am more on the back end of the farm, so I'm usually not there on the weekends, but um, I'm always working furiously in the weekdays to try to get everything ready for the weekends um, and just make sure that you have a really fun and smooth experience at Rocklands. So yeah, super glad to be here. All right, Sarah Siegel um, is our uh, general manager on site. So Sarah, could you just tell us a few words about yourself and what you do at Rocklands? 
Sure. Um, so I'm there um, every weekend. Um, I've uh, been working for Rockland's, um, I think, about four years now. Um, and I really enjoyed uh, getting to know a lot of our um, club members, recognize a lot of you who are on the call, um, and um, love every quarter when everyone comes in to pick up their boxes and, and I get to see everyone again. Um, I think that's it. <laughs> All right, and then Steph Carrillo is gonna say a few words. Um, she's our sales and marketing director and also has her hands in a lot of pots at Rockland's as does most of our staff with being such a small business. Steph? Hi, um, jack of all trades, master of none for Rockland's, it's great. Um, I recognize lots of faces too, super excited to see you guys here and to do this. Um, one other benefit Sean did not mention about doing it virtually is that you don't have to drive anywhere, therefore you can really go hard on the wine, so it's totally fine guys if you go through all the bottles of wine today, no problem at all. Um, just make sure you take the Advil before you go to bed tonight. Um, like Sean said, I do sales and marketing. I send the customer emails. So the ones that you get on Mondays and Thursdays, maybe you've unsubscribed. It's totally cool. Um, also do a lot of the social media, um, just like customer experience stuff. And then perhaps you have seen me shouting at everyone from the greeter tent um, this, this year. So kind of doing a lot of different things. Super happy to be here. Wish I was drinking wine tonight. All right, thanks, Steph. And then the newest addition of our team um, is Allegra Barnes. So Allegra and Michael work very closely together in the winery and in the vineyard. Allegra, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at Rockland's? Yeah, sure. Um, I am the newest member. It's my first year here. Um, I'm the new assistant winemaker. Um, I work with Michael every day, all day. Um, yeah, I'm from the area, so it's great to be back. Uh, I spent a little time farming like Chris, um, a little time in the service industry too. So I feel like it's kind of just like the marrying of those worlds. So yeah, happy to be here, learning everything. Yeah. Awesome, thanks Allegra. And then lastly, before we get to Michael, I wanna introduce Greg Glenn, who's our another founder of Rocklands and our CEO. Greg, could you say a few words? Yeah, so I'm Greg Glenn. Um, I started this farm with Sean back in 2010 um, and oversee the operation as well as raise uh, the livestock for the farm um, and do some of the educational programming. So really looking forward to tonight and thank you all for joining. Awesome, thanks Greg. And if you are, if you are a meat eater and you didn't know that was part of our business, um, definitely check that out. That's something we have in our tasting room and probably one of the big things that distinguishes us as a, um, other wineries in Maryland. Um, but and now we'll go into the main event. Michael will tell you all about other things that distinguish us and how we operate at Rocklands um, along with these tasty wines we have for you tonight. So Michael, take it away. Good. Thank you uh, for the introduction, Sean. And I'll say first, um, you know, thanks everyone for being here. I was having a little uh, Wi-Fi difficulty, so if I do drop out or anything, uh, everyone will have to let me know and I'll, I'll switch to my phone, uh, but I'll roll with uh, my computer while it works. Uh, but anyways, yeah, so my name is Michael. Um, I've been had a chance to meet a lot of you, uh, but if I hadn't met you, a little about myself. Uh, I came to Rocklands uh, last June, so I've been here for about, I'm sorry, not last June, the June before, wow. Uh, so I've been here for about a year and a half. Um, so this is my second harvest at Rocklands. Um, I got into winemaking out in California, uh, went out and did uh, to Switzerland to do my master's in viticulture and knowledge, and then came back to the United States, uh, was briefly in Virginia before popping up to Maryland. So um, I'm originally from North Carolina. Um, I'm really big on the East Coast uh, winemaking scene. I think there's just so much potential sitting in this, in this region. Uh, so phenomenal wines, um, great producers, great great growers. Uh, so just having a lot of fun and Rocklands has been a really great place to really carry on that, uh, that interest. So really happy to be uh, at Rocklands in general and really excited with what we're doing. Um, before we get into the wine tasting, I'll just give a little update with this past vintage and sort of what we've been doing. So uh, 2020 overall was a, was a great vintage. Uh, the year started off not too well. Um, we'll we won't even talk about COVID or anything, but actually in the vineyard, we had a, a big frost uh, late spring, actually uh, May. So 
it was a, a tough, a tough day. I got, you know, around 28 degrees on the farm. So that really set our crop um, in the vineyard uh, pretty far back. So we basically operated at about 20% of our expected yield this year. Um, but all that said, uh, we had some great, great sources and partners that we work with uh, within Maryland and Virginia. So we're able to still uh, secure good amount of fruit and overall some really high quality fruit. So both from our vineyard, even though it was less fruit, uh, really happy with it. And from our partners uh, at other vineyards, uh, got some really good fruit. So that was really exciting on that end. And then in the winery, um, like Allegra mentioned, she joined me this year. So that was really help helpful having her as the assistant winemaker. And uh, within the winery, we pushed the envelope a bit more in our winemaking techniques. So this is actually the first year at Rocklands we didn't add any commercial yeast to any of our fermentation. All right, I think we might have a technical difficulty with Michael. Is there anyone else experiencing the lack of audio? This year is really an opportunity to look at everything we were doing in the winery and look at the things Michael? we I'm sorry, yep. We lost you. You did? I'm sorry. Shoot. Yeah. Okay. Um, you might have to bear with me. I'm just going to switch to my phone because I think that's going to be better. So if you guys give me two minutes, let me log off and get back on. And that way we don't have any Wi Fi problems. Yeah, sorry. no problem at all. I'll, I'll just speak a little bit to kind of what Michael was saying, and then I'm sure you can fill in the blanks um, as far as the lack of inoculation of commercial yeast. So, um, just in general, um, we have we have wanted to go in a direction um, where the grapes can speak the loudest in the wines. And in some cases, the, the singular um, entity that's in the wines for many years, um, bringing on Michael a year and a half ago um, and, sh and him sharing that vision with our team uh, has made it possible to take some big steps that are, that might seem, um, I guess you could say, obvious to some but at the same time very um still very rare and uncommon in the world of wine so we're kind of turning back the clock in the way that we do things so to speak um doing things with almost less technology and less um less heavy handedness especially in the winery but also in the vineyard so one one which area that is is uh, a really big hurdle we climbed this year was to produce wines without the use use of commercial yeast. So um, the vast vast majority, I mean, ninety nine point plus percent of wines on the market um, are inoculated with yeast. And um, what what that is is essentially purchasing uh, either dry or liquid yeast from a laboratory um, to achieve a predictable and safe fermentation. You know, who, who, who wants their wine to go bad, right? Um, but the downside is um, those yeasts actually um, create, I mean, they create flavor. You're introducing something that's not originally in the vineyard um, into your wine. And so our, our, our wines without, uh, you know, with yeast added to them bad, no, that, that's not really what we're getting at, but we wanted to uh, produce wines that were more stripped down so that our vineyard and the vineyards that we source from could, could have a louder voice in the wines. And we wanted to work towards more purity in the winemaking. So um, we've had great results with it so far. We did um, several trial batches of that in 2019 and we're very encouraged by that. And we had a lot of exposure previously to wines um, around the world where it's a little more common uh, and a much more bigger movement uh, to go with this lower inter low intervention philosophy in places like Spain and France and Italy, but especially France and North, uh, Northeastern Spain. Um, and, and we kind of took a page from those books um, and, and again, just kind of turned back the clock, did, started doing things, um, you know, as, as people were making wine before the 1950s, before there was a big commercialization of, uh, of chemicals and, and additive sales in, that were, became very, very popular and now are commonplace in winemaking. So Michael can tell you, he gets a catalog of 
you know, that's yay thick uh, every year that's just full of wine additives that are able to be purchased. So, um, you know, we're mm -hmm. super excited to go in that direction where we can uh, produce wines that are more pure uh, from a health standpoint, but also from, we believe, a quality standpoint. So the great thing about the yeast in particular is that generally without inoculating them, one, we can introduce more of what the Rockwinds terroir is. There's yeast all around us. There's yeast in the winery, there's yeast in the vineyard, and the grapes in 2020, that's all they needed. And we had great results. All the, all the wines have fermented dry now. And um, also they are slower fermentations, which Michael can get into kind of the chemistry behind that. But what that does is it just, um, I think ultimately gives you more of like a nuance. You're not, you're not working the wine as hard. So you're getting more nuances in the wine, more complexities, and I think just overall more purity. Um, so we're super excited to go in that direction. And the ancestry in particular, which we'll jump into here in a minute, um, has, is a wine that is a sparkling wine, which kind of naturally caters to this low intervention style. Um, so um, this is a wine and the first wine that we've released for sale that is completely stripped of any additions whatsoever. Um, yep, exactly. Oh, sorry. Are you back on? I'm back on. I'm back on. Yeah, I've been. I've just been listening to you, Sean. Oh. You're so. You should make it like this, uh, yes, I'm back on. Um, apologies for that, everyone. I'm on my phone now, so uh, I can't read the chat or anything. But uh, yeah, hopefully I don't drop out here. But yeah, so as Sean was uh, mentioning, um, I guess we might as well just hop into the wine tasting, um, and we can sort of just continue talking about our philosophy and whatnot with the winemaking. Uh, but as Sean mentioned, so the first wine we're going to do tonight, this is our ancestry. Um, this is a 2020 ancestry. So there's actually, for this tasting, the only 2020 vintage that we're going to be tasting. Um, so a little bit about the interest, ancestry for those who aren't familiar. Um, it's a pet nat. Uh, so it's sort of become a, you know, a popular term. It basically means that the wine is bottled during its primary fermentation. Uh, meaning that there's no time in the process to filter the wine, to get out the sediment of the wine. Uh, so you can see the wine itself, it's a little cloudy. Um, there's a bit of lees at the bottom. Uh, don't let that scare you. Pet nuts are a lot of fun. Um, and we're very, very happy with this wine. So I'll go ahead and open it now. Um, give myself a pour so I can actually know what I'm talking about here. Um, so the 2020 Ancestry, uh, we were hoping to use um, our grapes from our vineyards, but like I said, we had the frost this spring, so we ended up sourcing the Chardonnay uh, from a, a vineyard partner up in Cecil County, Maryland. So it's 100% Chardonnay, um, real short on the winemaking process of this. Uh, it's pretty simple because we didn't you know, do much to it, but we basically harvested it very early uh, because we wanted to maintain a lot of that natural acidity present in the grapes. So it was harvested uh, late August. Uh, we had the fruit, we did a gentle press on it and basically just took uh, the light press of that fruit. Um, again, because it's a sparkling wine, uh, you really want to be gentle with the grapes when you press them just to really get the cleanest uh, fruit so it's not too bitter. Um, when we pressed it, we moved it to barrel. We let it sit in barrel for about 25 days. Um, and during that time, it began its uh, you know, native fermentation. And by the end of that fermentation, we moved it to the tank and then we bottled it um, in the middle of harvest, uh, which is always, uh, as a winemaker, uh, you know, people say pet nets are easy because you bottle them early, but uh, bottling in the middle of harvest is not the easiest thing as well. So we, uh, heart, we bottled, I think, I mean, I guess it would have been around late September uh, for this wine. And it's just been sit and bottle and then we released it this December. So. Uh, really happy with it. Um, you know, the bubbles that are in the wine come from the end of that fermentation. So they're, you know, bubbles from the yeast uh, fermenting. And so the wine itself has, you know, it's not necessarily as bubbly as you might expect from a champagne or something like that. Um, pet nuts are usually less bub bubbly than that. Uh, but there are some natural bubbles that do add sort of a nice mouthfeel creaminess to the wine. Um, the wine itself is not necessarily um, you know, loaded with really bright or big fruit. Um, it's more leaner, sort of these citrus fruits, um, you know, very much lemon, lime, fruits like that. Um, again, it was an early harvested grape, so 
not being on the vine as long, you don't get into those tropical fruits, but we actually think that plays a lot better to a, to a sparkling wine. And then it also has uh, a fair bit of sort of a biscuity or yeasty quality. Um, and this is primarily from uh, the yeast that we're fermenting uh, in this bottle. So, um, you know, it's a really nice wine. Uh, I'm a big fan of it. I don't know if any, you know, anyone else on the staff has any uh, no comments on it, but I always say it's one of my favorite wines. And, you know, a really good way to use Chardonnay. Um, the next one I'll be tasting is also Chardonnay, so we, we play around with it in a couple different ways. But um, I do think Chardonnay lends itself, uh, you know, very well for, uh, for sparkling. Yeah, Michael, and I think you've heard, um, or I think you've described it as like a shooting from the hip style of winemaking in terms of yeah. bottling it, you know, and <laughs> figuring out the best way to bottle it and the right timing, really, especially given the, the laboratory situation. Yeah, no, it really is shooting from the hip. That's a, that's a good way to put it. Um, and yeah, so at Rockland's, you know, it's really fun uh, to be at Rockland's because we really, you know, we have sort of this authentic, you know, historic barn feel. Uh, but with that comes sort of the historic barn laboratory. So we don't have a whole lot on, on that side of things. We really need a whole lot, but um, it does make it a bit, you know, basically, long story short, the, the bubbles or the carbonation that's going to be in a bottle is directly related to the glucose fructose that's available um, for the yeast to eat and then convert um, to alcohol and also CO2, which makes the bubbles. So, you know, if you have, you know, a big laboratory, you can sort of know exactly the day that you bottle it. Um, you can be a little more confident uh, with the bubbles that you're going to end up with. But, you know, in much more of the traditional way of doing pet mats, how we do it at Rockland's is, you know, we're sort of tasting every day. Um, you know, we do measure uh, what is called brick. So that's basically, um, you know, the density of, of the wine. And with that density, you can sort of predict uh, what the sugar is at. But it's, you know, it basically is a, you know, a hydrometer that you float, um, you know, in the wine itself. So it's a, you know, pretty old school way of measuring um, anything like that. So I have a general idea of where the wine is in its fermentation, but there is a bit of, uh, you know, you bottle it and you cross your fingers and hope, uh, you know, the bottles don't start exploding a few weeks later when they all start fermenting too much because that can be the problem um, with pet nets especially is, is just being over carbonated so that when you open them, yeah. um, you know, they're yeah. just, they just overflow. So this one's nice. Um, if anyone's familiar with the 2019 Ancestry, um, similar in a lot of ways, both 100% Chardonnay, um, you know, that one was from our vineyard. Uh, but as I mentioned, that was not available this year. Um, but this one's a little less bubbly than last year's, um, but still some really nice natural present bubbles uh, that really plays well with the, with the wine. Yeah, and then speaking of it, it definitely not an exploding wine, we we had that in earlier vintage of the Ancestry. If you were have been with us for several years, I'm sure Sarah can ser share some horror stories of opening those bottles in front of customers in the tasting room. But we do have a question, and just because we do have, not a huge group here. Uh, just feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask a question. That's probably the best way to do it. So I think uh, Mindy and Guy, you all, you all had a question for Michael. Did you hear the question? Oh, no. Uh, no, but we can hear you now. This came in. So yeah, could you repeat that? Yeah, I wondered why you used a bottle cap instead of a cork. Ah, uh, yes. Great, great question, Guy. Um, so, yeah, so you usually see the bottle caps with pet mats a lot of the time. Um, the reason that we do use the bottle cap is, is actually the standard way to bottle, um, you know, any bottle fermented wine during the, the, the time that you bottle it. So to take a step back, say you're taking a champagne, what they'll actually do is you'll bottle it and then they'll cap it and then later do a process called disgorgement where you remove the leaves from the bottle. Uh, with pet nets, you traditionally don't disgorge them, thus you leave the leaves in bottle. So you sort of do the first process where you put on just the bottle cap and, and then you, know, you just don't do anything after that. And then the bottle cap just, Logistically, it's a lot easier to put a bottle cap. Not to say it's not possible, but uh, just for the, the flow of things, um, we just use the bottle cap. So um, that is basically why they do that. And I would just just pepper in here. Um, 
on uh, I guess a little bit more of the sales side we, you know we, we have a lot of Chardonnay haters out there and what's not the I mean everyone has their own styles but um, for a lot of people year after year of like buttery California Chardonnay may have turned a lot of people off to the grape but um, and I know that Michael feels the same way please give chardonnay another chance it can be so many more things than a buttery uh warm climate grape uh or wine um and i think this is another style that really lends itself i mean the main the main grape in champagne is chardonnay along with pinot noir mm -hmm. so keep that in mind but chardonnay is so versatile and and this wine's a great example of that um using it as an early harvest sparkling wine with that really nice racy acidity um and i i can mm -hmm. see some folks enjoying it right now with big smiles so i think it's getting good reviews from the members right. thus far. Like say, yeah and, and to that point sean a little more about chardonnay um you know something especially in the mid-atlantic um you know when it comes to growing grapes is just how to toe the line of you know producing grapes but also being sustainable uh you know the reality is that we have you know a level of disease and pest pressure that is you know different than you know some of these other places that are more like desert um you know just with the amount of rain that we get so chardonnay it's certainly not perfect in the vineyard um you know there does take some management of it but uh compared to some other grapes um it really you know does a does a pretty good job does you know a decent job of um of hanging in there and being you know working well with us in the vineyard and allowing us to manage it in a way that we feel um you know happy about so Another reason to be a fan of Chardonnay, like you said, um, you know, there's just so much of it. There's lots of good examples, lots of bad examples, and you know, there's so many different ways to do it. Like I said, we'll do our, our next wines with Chardonnay as well. But yeah, we love it for sparkling and especially for the pet map. So I think that's something we're gonna definitely continue, um, you know, here on out. And and just one other clarification, you had mentioned uh, with the sediment in the bottom being a young wine that it was the mostly the lees of the wine. Can you just um, just clarify what the lees are for anyone um, on the call and 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 why yep. that's not a um, health concern <laughs> or anything like that? <laughs> exactly. Yes. Um, so the lees, uh, yeah, it's a winemaking term. It basically would it you know simply put it just means the, the solids that fall out of solution um so that can be anything from um you know just small particles of the grape skins and whatnot that fall out as well as the yeast uh, when they're done fermenting and then if you actually do have a ball of ancestry and you look at it you'll notice that it actually crystallizes a bit so it sort of you know falls out into what these look like sheets of, of crystals almost and that's actually um, the tartrate, so it's uh, potassium bitartrate that falls out of solution um, when they combine the potassium and the tartrate combined with each other, they fall out of solution. Um, you know, with most wines, there's a process when you're getting ready to bottle it that you'll sort of set it up for, you know, cold stability, heat stability, and these are different things to sort of get those things so they don't happen in bottle. Um, but again, with, with the pet mat, uh, there's no time to do that, really no way to do it. So um, that's, that's what you see at the bottom. And then we do have one more question, probably before we move mm -hmm. on to the quarry. Um, we froze out our vineyard this year. The question is, do we anticipate using our Chardonnay in our home vineyard for the ancestry in 2021? Yes. So we would like to use um, the Chardonnay from our vineyard for the ancestry. Um, we still have other Chardonnay that we, you know, we source from other places that would, you know, go and different wines but uh we at least myself again ancestry is one of my favorite wines i love spark for there um putting it for it in the future as long as we don't have another frost so you know obviously touch wood <laughs> well yeah everyone uh knows this has been a difficult year um but yeah. you know kind of jokingly uh you know, at least we got this wine out of it so far. <laughs> so yeah. um, <laughs> exactly. right. I think we can move on to the next wine. But okay. again, feel free to keep the questions coming. Um, and again, just given our group size, um, feel free to unmute yourself and jump right in with a question. And feel free to ask a question um, from a previous wine. So it doesn't, you know, if he's 
something pops into your head about the ancestry or something about what I said, um, you know, we can always go back. So go ahead and open uh, the quarry here. So for anyone who's following along, um, we'll be opening the 2019 quarry. So actually another Chardonnay, um, not from this past vintage, but from 2019. Um, we just released this wine about, I think, two or three weeks ago. Um, and a little about it. Um, this was my first harvest at Rocklands. Um, we sourced this fruit from a, a vineyard up in Cecil County, Maryland. Um, so, you know, not too far away from us. It's 100% Chardonnay. And this is our sort of barrel fermented Chardonnay. So we, we, we were actually just speaking about how, you know, we're trying to avoid sort of that buttery, overly barreled um, Chardonnay. So it's not to say that we we're trying to make that style, but we also, you know, did understand that, you know, people do like Chardonnay in barrel. Um, and there's a lot of phenomenal Chardonnays made around the world uh, that use the barrel. So our chance to do it is we use only neutral oak. So the idea of using no new oak uh, in the production allows us to really highlight natural fruit in the wine um, rather than any oak in the wine. And um, we also, you know, no additives, no sort of oak additives or anything like that. Um, and yeah, and so as far as the production side of this, uh, you know, pretty simple. Um, we brought in the fruit, we pressed it, um, we moved it to tank, and then we barreled it down uh, where it went with fermentation and barrel. Uh, when it was finished fermenting, uh, we basically, you know, we top up the barrels. So when they're fermenting, they need a little more space, but when everything's finished, uh, we just go in and sort of fill it back up. Um, we basically take one barrel to use it to fill all the other barrels. And then the wine basically just sat in those barrels um, for about nine months or so. Um, I guess maybe a little, yeah, nine months. Um, all we did during that time was pop it. So, you know, about once a month, Allegra or myself, uh, we have to go around and pop up the wine. A lot of people have heard the term angel share when they talk about whiskey. Uh, so it's similar in wine where, you know, a bit of wine just evaporates, um, you know, over the course of time. You need to make sure you go in and pop up those barrels because uh, you want to make sure you always have a full barrel. So when it was ready to get bottled, uh, we moved the wine to tank um, and then we bottled it. Um, you know, it was unfined, unfiltered, so it didn't go through any sterile filtration or any fining. Um, so it's fairly clear, although not necessarily as clear um, if it would be if it had been filtered. But, um, but yeah, a wine, you know, we're very happy with. Um, for me, this wine, again, shows a lot more of sort of the aged oak uh, influence to it. So, you know, a lot of the aromatics I get, I get some nice stone fruit. Um, but again, I also get sort of like a baked biscuit, sort of baked, I don't know, flavor overall. That's sort of from that, that aging and that sort of slow, um, you know, oxidation of the wine while it's in barrel. And then it did go through malolactic fermentation. So to explain malolactic uh, fermentation real quickly for anyone who doesn't know, um, there's two fermentations we talk about when we're making wine. Uh, the first is what everyone knows and loves. Uh, it converts uh, sugar to alcohol. So that's the one that makes wine super fun. Uh, but then there's actually a second fermentation that takes place, um, a bacterial driven fermentation. And this fermentation uh, makes turns malic acid into lactic acid. So if you think malic acid, you can think an apple and you think lactic acid, you think milk. So sort of moving from sort of what is a crisp sort of apple, apple acidity to a more creamier, um, you know, milk-like acid. Um, so this went through malolactic fermentation. So what that does is it sort of takes the edge off the wine a bit, makes it a little less sharp and angular, um, and rather makes it sort of rounder, smoother mouthfeel um, sort of sits in the mouth as well. So, um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan. Like we, we talked about a Chardonnay and trying it all ways. Um, this is a wine we actually we didn't do um, in 2020. So um, if you like it, you better get some uh, now because there's going to be you know, no coming out um, in 2020 this year. But uh, the 2019 tasting really well and a wine definitely built um, to be able to age for a few years. Awesome. So I think this is actually a, um, and we can jump back into the wine in a second. But um, as you've probably noticed with a lot of our labels, um, most of them have some sort of, uh, well, they all have a relation to the farm in one way or another, um, but some more than others have a significant historical context. So this is one of those where there's kind of a neat historical context behind it. Um, the Seneca Quarry, which is a local quarry to Rockland. So 
Greg, I was hoping that you could just share a few words about what the quarry is and kind of how it's linked to Rocklands. Yeah, so the, um, if you guys don't know, the Potomac River is about two miles from Rocklands, uh, due south of us. And the closest entry point is Riley's Lock. And if you go down this gravel road on the opposite side of Seneca Creek um, from the lock, you get uh, to this really cool old stone mill. And just behind the mill up on the rock side is the quarry. And so all of the Seneca stone that Rocklands is made from, um, some of it was harvested from the creek right by the bridge, but a lot of it came from the quarry about a mile and a half away. And that's the same quarry that sourced uh, the stones for like the Smithsonian Museum, CNO Canal, things like that. And so like all of our labels, we'd like to kind of have them touch the you know, story to Rocklands. And so that quarry um, is just a really fun part of our uh, geology, part of our history, you know, part of our area. So, um, yeah. And also, can you mention, is, that's the historical name of Rockland's Farm as well, correct? Rockland, so it was like from the 1870s? Yeah, yeah, when we started Rockland's, we kind of dug around and, and the original name of the farm is Rockland's. So that's how we, we decided to, to stick with that name, so, yep. Yeah, and whether you work in the vineyard or whether you work in the tasting room, you've been impacted in one way or another by the plethora of rocks at Rocklands. <laughs> so um, we definitely true to its namesake. Um, and, and I thought we thought when we came out with this one a few years ago, that um, just kind of the the minerality, um, the kind of the rock qualities, if you will, that can be present in Chardonnay, um, were kind of an you know, appropriate name for a label such as this. So any questions from anyone about the quarry Chardonnay? A little bit of a, I guess, more common style um, for maybe what folks are used to for Chardonnay. Keep in mind that, again, just wanna try to give Chardonnay even more credibility here on the call. Um, you know, some of the most, not just champagne, but white burgundy Chardonnay. So some of the most expensive white wine in the world, also Chardonnay, keep that in mind. So Michael, I, I hate for you to have to, can you hear me first of all? Yeah, okay. So I'm sorry I missed this, but the, so the quarry, the rocks, does that create the ter terrar or terrar of the grapes growing influence it that way? Or is it the influence, do you use water at all in this process that the, the water that comes through the quarry or the rocks, is that an influencer as well or? How do the rocks actually influence this wine? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, so this particular wine, again, this is not our, our vineyard of the source, so they certainly a little different than our vineyard, but I can speak, you know, to the rocks themselves. Uh, they do play a really big role, um, you know, in the, in the vineyard, um, primarily just based on just like the water draining capacity of the soil, as well as like the available nutrients and just the overall, um, you know, vigor of the soil. So something that, you know, on the Mid-Atlantic that we, at Rocklands that we have to work for is actually we're fighting against vigor. So it sort of goes against uh, one might, what uh, someone might think when they're just, you know, thinking about it. Oh, you want a plant to grow as much as you can. But um, the reality is actually we want the vine to, you know, we always say we want the vines to struggle a little bit, um, meaning that rather than put all their energy into the canopy growth and being, you know, big, lush, green plants, uh, that they struggle a little bit and that the plant um, instead puts a lot of its resources into the fruit and thus sort of you know creates more interesting complex uh, fruit so specifically to the rocks um, what we found at our vineyard site is because it's so rocky um, it actually can sort of help control this vigor uh, because there's sort of less uh, growth available uh, for the vines themselves um, on the other side of things with the water, um, you know, we don't add any water to the wine itself, um, you know, or to the vineyard. Um, we're dry farmed, meaning that we're not irrigated. Um, we, get, we get plenty of water, so we're usually not um, necessarily needing any more, but we don't necessarily add water to any of the vines on our own. Um, and then we've noticed that, you know, there's certain areas on our site that have more water than others. And, you know, generally we want to plant our vines to sort of avoid um, you know, any type of underground water as we can. So 
Um, that's basically is, you know, is in, in terms of the, the rocks and the, the water at, the, at Rockland. All right, cool. So, well, let's just go ahead and move on to the last line. We're All right. doing great here on time. Right, right. Um, and again, feel free to jump in with any questions as we yeah, feel free. Uh, up the hillside. Yeah. yeah, so as I open up the hillside, as Sean said, it's our last one of the night, the hillside. Um, this is a fun wine. Um, and it really, uh, this is another 2019 and a wine I had a lot of fun making. Um, it's primarily, but it also has Merlot and Chardonnay in it. Um, which is obviously probably not a blend of a red wine that people hear about too often, especially when, uh, you know, that Chardonnay in there. Um, but to give a little explanation um, of why Wolf is an earlier release red wine, um, not super early, but, you know, we aged it in oak for about, um, you know, nine months before we release it. Um, so it does not go past vintage. Um, and because of this wine is primarily Super Doe, uh, which is a grape that we really like. Um, it grows really well at Rocklands and with our neighboring partners at Vineyards. Um, we really, you know, wanted to highlight the Super Doe in this wine. Um, but the reality is that the Super Doe is a sort of bigger structured wine uh, with a lot of natural acid um, that can be a little aggressive in its younger years. So a lot of times you see the wine. Um, you know, barrel age for maybe 16 months, 18 months, and then age, you know, another portion of time um, in bottle before you actually release it. And that's primarily due to the tannins of the Petit Verdot. Uh, they can be pretty astringent um, and not really open up uh, given, you know, even a time period of nine months. So we were starting thinking about the hillside last year. Uh, we still wanted to get Petit Verdot out there because, again, there's this vibrant acidity naturally present. Um, and so we started thinking about it. Well, how can we do that? How can we soften it up a little bit? Um, so Merlot came to mind, but then we also, you know, had the idea of using a white grape um, to do that. Um, it's not uncommon in the wine world. Um, you actually see it in a lot of different blends. Uh, probably the most famous would be uh, Syrah being blended with, you know, Viognier um, in the Rhone Valley in France. Uh, but you also see it with um, in Rioja in Spain and also some places in Italy. So it's certainly not like we're uh, reinventing the wheel here, but we wanted to be a little open-minded of what we we're doing. And so the Chardonnay that we did use, uh, we treated it like a, uh, like a red wine. So rather than, you know, make Chardonnay in stainless steel tank, and then just use, you know, we didn't just use the juice from the quarry and then put it into the hillside. Um, we actually harvested these grapes with the intention of, you know, putting them into this wine, making them like the red wine. So the Chardonnay itself, you know, had that structure uh, that you get from a red wine that you develop from having time on the skins um, during its fermentation, but then also sort of had this softness to it, um, you know, really that allowed us to blend in with the Petit Verdot and Merlot and ultimately allowed us to make a wine that, you know, very, very happy to be releasing, um, you know, when we did. So that's, uh, you know, the three components that we used, um, just briefly on the winemaking. I mean, I basically covered it, but, you know, we, we harvested the grapes, uh, we fermented them in these individual, uh, basically, fermenters, so about, uh, you know, 8.8 .8 ton fermenters. Um, they fermented on the skins for, you know, each fermentation is different, but it can last anywhere between 10 days to three weeks, just sort of depending on um, you know, whatever, I <laughs> usually sort of have to allow the, uh, the fermentation to do its thing. Uh, but once it was done fermenting, we pressed the, pressed the grapes um, and, you know, we, we drained off the, what was the wine at that point. And then we moved that all to barrel uh, where it sat. And then when we got ready for bottling, uh, we did our blending trials. We sort of figured out as a group. Um, it's a fun day in the winery when we do the blending trials. Um, you know, everyone sits down, we taste a lot of the wines, sort of see what works well with what, and sort of fine tune all these wines. And then once we get the blend that we like, we move all of that wine to one tank to, you know, mix it up and get it the wine that we want it to be. And then we bottled it. So this wine was, you know, not filtered, not fine, um, you know, it was bottled. And I guess uh, it's a little confusing with this. Uh, I think it was bottled around uh, June. So um, that's sort of the story of the hillside as far as the tasting notes go. I guess I got to pour myself a glass so you guys believe me. I think that's for, um, 
But the wine itself, like I said, it's, it still has that nice acidity uh, that you get from the Cuvée Verdot. Um, there's also, a, for me, just a, an herbal quality uh, from Cuvée Verdot, which is you know, very uh, common for, that, for the grape. Uh, but then also some really nice red fruit. Um, I think the Merlot really adds that about 25% of the, of the, of the wine. Um, so it makes it a little rounder, easier to approach. Um, but yeah, I mean, overall wine we're very happy with. Um, and, you know, we'll see this year what the blend looks like. Um, we won't be using Chardonnay, but we have some other things up our sleeve um, that we're thinking are going to work really well with it. So that's all I, that's all I have. I have to take a sip now. Yeah, a lot of talking. Make sure you stay fresh. Keep the vocal cords fresh. You know, get a, yeah. Okay, um, Michael, I have another question. Yes. Sorry. Okay, yes. so I'm not a Chardonnay drinker, so you got me one over. I, I really like your pet net and the ancestry. Yeah, the mm -hmm. ancestry. And I love that white. So tell me why, like this red now, the hillside, which I love too, um, has a lower alcohol content. Then yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a great question, Mindy. Um, you know, the reality of it is it's it's sometimes you just sort of give what the grapes give you. And as I mentioned before, we don't have a super high tech laboratory. So when we bring in the grapes, um, we're basically measure, measuring this, you know, what's called bricks. Um, so it's, it's the density in that. I can sort of make a prediction for what things will look like. And that's primarily due, I mean, your starting point is just what, um, you can, one can also, you know, add sugar if you want. Um, that's a possible thing to do. And we've, we do do that with certain wines, um, but we actually did not do that with this, either any of these wines actually here tonight. But um, so you're sort of starting with the initial sugar that's in the grape. Um, and then the other component is just, the yeast, whoever, you know, whatever yeast does your fermentation, um, they'll just have different conversion rates. So sometimes a yeast will convert, you know, the sugar to alcohol and it'll be, you know, a high conversion rate and sometimes it won't. I mean, a lot of times it has to do with the temperature of the fermentation. Um, if the yeast are unhappy during the fermentation, if something happens, they get too hot, they get too cold, a lot of time those conversion factors will go down. Um, and then sort of out pops at the end, uh, the actual alcohol of the wine. So, I mean, the reality is that when we harvested this, you know, Chardonnay in 2019, and then the, you know, the three components of this wine, um, it just ended up that the hillside had less alcohol than the Chardonnay. And the irony is that um, I, I do know that these two Chardonnay sources, um, you know, come from the same vineyard. So, you know, part of it that we use, you know, going towards the hillside, um, as you, as you mentioned, the quarry has a higher alcohol than the hillside. So the funny part is probably the Chardonnay actually helps bring up the alcohol in this wine compared <laughs> to the Petit Verdot and Merlot. Um, both those, again, when we got them from the vineyard, they were, um, you know, lower in sugar. And so the Chardonnay ended up sort of bringing up that alcohol. But yeah, it's certainly, you know, 12, I guess, you have the, yeah, 12.8% alcohol. So it's certainly lower. Um, we're all we're comfortable working in these lower alcohol ranges. Um, you know, as we mentioned at the beginning of the call, you know, one of our goals with Rocklands and our winemaking style is to really, you know, just authentic with what uh, we're bringing into the winery and really limit the amount of you know any manipulation that's happening within the winery. And so one of those things is just accepting the reality that the Mid Atlantic, um, you know, in Maryland where we are we're not um, gonna you know, have every day of summer be sunny and these huge ripening, you know, 15 and a half percent alcohol wines yeah. uh, that you can find yeah. elsewhere. So- and Thank um, you for that. Michael, thank you. As an elderly drinker, I can't <laughs> handle a 15 percent. Yeah. Yeah. And I love, I can drink a red like this and not feel mm -hmm. blasted the next day. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm right there with you, Mindy. And yeah, no, we, we often say, again, we're probably closer to Europe than we are to California, just as yeah. far as like the style that, that's going to come about uh, from Rockland. And especially, you know, you see that uh, with alcohol. So um, yeah, it just, that's how the cards played out uh, last year. So yeah, thank you. Fun. You're doing a great yeah. job. Uh, with anytime. That. Anytime. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and Mindy, it's not just you. There's, a, there's definitely a growing trend just mm -hmm. towards, 
uh, I think just preference for lower alcohol right. wines. I think a lot of people are just pretty burnt out with yeah, that big 15, stuff. 5%, yeah. whatever. It's like, whoa, like really? And I think that's the European difference. You travel in Europe, you never have a hangover. It's like, what is that? You can drink wine for lunch and for dinner. You never feel mm -hmm. bad. And you drink here in America and you're hit with these big alcohol contents and you feel like right. crap. So yeah. I love this, what you're doing. <laughs> and if anyone's wondering, we, this wasn't intentional, but um, I'm kind of just realizing now that every wine that we uh, showcase tonight has Chardonnay in it. <laughs> so that was not, <laughs> that was uh, not we're do like a, a, a once over on everyone, but just kind of <laughs> how the cards right. fell. Um, and if you're wondering why the third wine's not Montevideo, which was in the winemaker selection pack, we do also have kind of a red wine club. And we also, as everyone probably knows, um, the ability to customize their shipment. So we wanted to mix it up a little bit and, and just put a wine in that wasn't part of the winemaker selection pack just to kind of uh, appeal to those that might have skipped out on the Montevideo or, or done one of the other packs. So that's kind of why we chose the Hillside. And it was also one of our, our newer release red wines, um, just in case mm -hmm. you were wondering about that. Um, so any, it'd also be, it'd be harder for me to talk about the Montevideo, uh, since I didn't make that one. So it's another reason to not do it. Exactly. Um, all right. Does anyone else have any, um, any follow-up questions about the hillside or any of the wines from tonight or just any questions in general about Rocklands? Um, we've got just a few more minutes here on our call. Um, and, and just wanted to see if there's any way that we can further engage you while we have these few minutes. I, I would love to ask about your business model. <laughs> oh yeah, what, what's, uh, do you mean specifically like the direct to consumer? Well, no, just, you, you as investors who bought the, I admire so much where you developed this, but did you buy the, the vineyard or buy the lands and I'm curious kind of how the business is put together. Yeah, I can speak towards that. Um, so um, my family, I grew up in Bethesda in the DC area. Uh, my family, like many of you all, just enjoyed driving out to the Ag Reserve. And uh, in 2003, we moved to the Rocklands property and Obviously, it's a beautiful historic property. It was quite run down when we moved there, um, much like um, the spring house looks like or the smokehouse little log cabin next to the stone house. Um, and so for a number of years, we just lived there and it was not a vineyard. It was just old horse pasture. The lower vineyard in the family area um, was a swamp. The two ponds didn't exist. The lower barn where the tasting room is was like a pig pen um, and chickens and geese were there in like 2013. Um, in 2010 when Sean and I started the farm it was kind of a one-off let's try to do some organic produce in a little roadside stand and after about two or three years of doing that um, of people really enjoying coming out to the farm um, we decided to start trying to make some wine. That was my dad's interest. He loves orcharding and planted a couple Concord grapes he bought at Home Depot in the front area. Um, and so we essentially just made some pretty small batches of wine in the basement of the stone house. Wow. And in 2014, we, we redid the lower part of the barn. And so to answer your question about the business model, it's, it's owned by my family. Um, and it started just very organically just kind of a trial thing and it really grew organically from there. Um, and so the people you see on the screen are the people who are running the operation on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so yeah, we all just really enjoy what we do and, and put, put in a good day's work with yeah. as a team. So. Well, thank you for sharing this. Do you have anything to add to that? You guys been around? Yeah, I mean, I'll just say specifically um, kind of the biggest, I guess revelation like Greg kind of hit on in the early years was that people wanted to come to us um, and connect with what we were doing and we loved connecting with them 
And there's a lot that's changed at Rocklands over the years, but that's remained the same. 99% of our sales plus are direct to consumer. So, you know, we don't sell to distributors in other states. We don't really sell to like restaurants or wine shops or anything like that. And while that is, does create a more labor intensive business model that, um, you know, you have to have a hand on every single sale that's made, um, which is usually a bottle, a bottle or two. Um, what that does allow us to do is to have more of an intimate re interaction in the sale to really have a relationship with the customer and to also tell the story, um, which was really important to us. And Michael, you know, explained a lot tonight about, how we produce the wine and that's part of the Rockland story. And, you know, if a bottle is just sitting on the shelf in a grocery store, you can only tell so much of the story. So um, we, we, we were, we're, we're, it's a pleasure to be able to provide that sort of service with our model. Thank you. Um, great. Well, um, we are wrapping up now and just wanted to thank everyone for coming out tonight um, virtually to log in here. We hope to be able to offer this sort of thing again. If you do have any feedback, um, feel free to shoot me an email at sellerclub at rocklandsfarmmd.com. I'd uh, greatly welcome that or just reply to any of the emails that have gone out recently and we will review that. And then we just want to remind everyone that we are open this weekend if you're in the DC area. Uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but then we are closing down for a couple weeks for our annual break, which we look forward to all year. Uh, it's the only time of year that we close down. So we'll be closed from this coming Monday through Thursday, January 7th, and then we'll reopen back up on the 8th. However, we will continue to ship wine uh, both locally and uh, to other states that we ship to around the country while we are closed. So if you need a Rocklands fix during that time, we got you covered. And otherwise, we, it was so nice to see so many friendly faces. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone on the team. Um, and thank you especially to all you Seller Club members who are the backbone of support here at Rocklands to make it all possible. So uh, we really appreciate your time and have a great evening. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.